another woman here, uh, Ariadne. And you may know the story of uh, Ariadne and Theseus. Uh, Theseus, of course, uh, is trying to slay the Minotaur. Uh, Ariadne shows him how to get in and out of the labyrinth, or to get, excuse me, Ariadne shows him how to get out of the labyrinth, uh, which was one of the problems. Um, the Minotaur, half bull, half man, uh, was uh, imprisoned, as it were, in this incredible maze. Uh, and uh, was sent in sacrifices of Greek youths uh, who they would kill and eat. Um, and so Theseus goes to kill the Minotaur, but even if he succeeds, how is he going, how is he going to find his way out of the labyrinth? So Ariadne, uh, the daughter of King Minos, um, shows him the way. Uh, with the agreement that he's, you know, she's fallen in love with him and he's supposed to take her with her and marry her. And of course the way into the Minotaur, uh, way out of the labyrinth is with a ball of string. And she gives him a ball of string and she says you just unroll this as you go through and then you roll it up when you come back. She's very clever. <laughs> um, he supposedly is very grateful except he abandons her on an island. And uh, you know, there's two versions of the story. One, Theseus is just being horribly nasty um, and betraying her. And the other one is the story um, that they've stopped at this island and Ariadne falls asleep and a storm comes up and the storm blows the ship away and, you know, Theseus would like to get back to her but he can't, back, just can't. Well, what happens? Uh, is she just going to die on this desolate island? Uh, no. The god Dionysus, or Bacchus. No, Dionysus is the Greek, Bacchus is the Roman. Uh, god of wine uh, comes with his retinue <laughs> to this island, and he discovers Ariadne, and uh, he's taken with her beauty. He makes her his wife. Uh, she's mortal, of course, and when she dies, uh, the, he takes her crown and places it in the heavens as the southern crown. Um, as we said, uh, Kaufman learned her anatomy from uh, draped figures and from classical statues and paintings. And you can see that uh, um, there's no inappropriate parts <laughs> showing uh, that Bacchus is strategically draped. It's enough to show that yes, she does understand anatomy, um, but yes, she's also a modest woman. So here we have uh, Ariane possibly just waking up um, with uh, Bacchus being led by Cupid, the god of love, uh, in, uh, to see his, his wife-to-be. Uh, another classical figure, of course, is Sappho. Uh, Sappho, the most famous and probably maybe the only known, <laughs> but certainly the most famous woman uh, poet of classical antiquity, and this is Sappho inspired by love uh, to write her poetry. And love, of course, is the little uh, god Cupid, or the god of love, uh, who's here serving as a, a kind of a diminutive muse uh, as she turns to him uh, and gestures to her artwork. All of these, of course, are very idealized figures because that was uh, neoclassicism um, was very interested in idealized figures, uh, very calm, very graceful, uh, things that they felt were uh, appropriate for art. Uh, one of the famous stories from classical antiquity uh, is the painter who needs to paint Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman. So he gets all of these models, and he, from one he takes the breast, and from another he takes the nose, for another he takes the eyes. In other words, he picks out the, I guess somebody has the most beautiful elbow, I don't know, but <laughs> uh, at any rate, he picks the most beautiful parts of each uh, to uh, incorporate in his uh, painting of uh, Helen of Troy. And of course, as everyone has said ever since then, is that might not work out so well <laughs> because the parts might not be in proportion. So presumably he uh, fixed the proportions. But here he's looking at the model, deciding uh, what, what is, who has the most beautiful what. <laughs> um, this is a painting that I just saw uh, fairly recently. 
Uh, it is Jupiter and Callisto. It's attributed to Angelica Kaufman, probably is. Uh, it's in the St. Petersburg, Florida Museum of Fine Arts. And it, you know, it looks like two young ladies uh, getting very cozy <laughs> with each other. Uh, however, what it is is the, the story of uh, Jupiter seducing uh, Callisto. Jupiter had a habit of uh, falling in lust with mortal women, uh, some of whom probably wouldn't have welcomed him. And so he would uh, hide himself uh, in the guise, uh, the appearance of uh, some other creature. Uh, both to get closer to his uh, the, his uh, amarata, <laughs> get closer to the women he was trying to seduce, and also uh, to hide from his wife Hera, who or Juno, who was really not amused by uh, Jupiter's ex escapades. Um, so what Jupiter realizes he's not going to get close to Callisto. Callisto is a follower of Diana or Artemis. And um, she has devoted herself to uh, the woodlands, the hunt, and to virginity. Um, so he might have a little problem with her. So what he does is he takes on the appearance of Artemis or Diana, you know, of her goddess. And that way he's able to get very, very close to Callisto and, uh, you know, until she doesn't realize what's happening until it's too late. So as you can see, this, uh, this figure that looks like Diana, he has a crescent moon in her hair, or his hair, so the appearance of Diana, and uh, has a quiver, is really Jupiter. And I don't know if you can make it out in this uh, picture, but there is a uh, eagle here uh, at his feet. Uh, and uh, so the eagle is the symbol of Jupiter. So that's you know, letting us in on the fact that this is not just uh, Diana. And then in the bushes we have a little Cupid once again. Um, in this case, um, it's uh, lustful. I have to put love in, in uh, quotation marks. It's not really love, it's really lust. And of course, poor Callisto uh, conceives a child uh, from this rape and uh, is thrown out of the uh, the band of Diana's followers and incurs the wrath of Juno, who turns her into a bear. And when her child grows up, he's a hunter and he slays her. He kills her thinking she's a bear. Uh, and then uh, she is placed in the heavens as the great bear, Ursa Major, and her son as Ursa Minor. So she, the, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Uh, here is uh, a fairly unusual subject. I've, I've, never, I've never seen anyone else do this subject. Virgil writing his own epitaph. So she doesn't just use female figures, also very famous classical figures. Um, this is another subject that you know, might not be terribly familiar today um, and is not very often portrayed. Uh, it's Cornelia, the mother of the Graeci, Graeci uh, being uh, very famous Romans. Uh, and this is uh, from Roman history. Once again, uh, Angelica Kaufman showing off her classical knowledge. And I don't mean show off, I mean she's, you know, she's choosing uh, interesting themes. Um, the story goes that Cornelia, who is the good Roman matron, uh, has her friend is here. You can see the friend in red seated there. And uh, her friend is showing her her treasures, her jewels. She's brought over her jewel box and she's exhibiting her beautiful golden necklaces and things like this. Uh, the little girl seems much taken with it. She's playing with the pretty uh, uh, shiny objects. And uh, Cornelia's friend says, well, Cornelia, now I've shown you my jewels or my treasures, depending on your translation. Now you show me your jewels, or you show me your treasures. And Cornelia points to her children and says, these are my treasures, these are my jewels. So we're seeing the good mother of uh, antiquity. Uh, it's the strong Roman matron who uh, raised up such fine children. Uh, 
uh, to serve Rome. It's also a theme that becomes very, very popular in the 18th century. And I don't mean the subject of Cornelia, I mean the theme of the good mother. We may not think about this, uh, but in the 18th century, uh, philosophers started uh, speculating about what the natural man was and had this idea of you know, people being more natural. And one of the themes was that it was natural for a woman to love her children and to nurture her children and to be a good mother. And that theme becomes so important in 18th century art. And it's a good theme for a woman artist as well, uh, whether she has children or not, uh, because it would be associated uh, with women. Uh, this is uh, in the for, uh, Richmond, Virginia, uh, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And it has just beautiful, beautiful colors uh, that's very warm without being, you know, obsessive or, uh, you know, uh, warm colors, uh, oranges and golds, uh, yellows, reds are all warm colors. Um, you know, they can be too hot, but here it just gives you the, the warmth and then it contrasts with the blue of the landscape. Um, and the white, which you can see uh, Cornelia is wearing. Um, so you have this nice, warm, intimate feeling there. Uh, the composition is beautifully balanced. Cornelia is erect, upright, virtuous, uh, just slightly off-center, uh, giving a little more liveliness, a little more interest uh, to the, the way the figures are arranged. Um, and so you have the, the, the women sort of bunched closely together, uh, the little girl who is contrasting with her mother because she doesn't realize that, you know, the jewels aren't the most important thing. She just thinks they're pretty little things and she's playing with them. She's still too young. Um, and uh, Cornelia, of course, is dressed, as you can see, all in white. So her eye goes to her uh, with, the, the, of course, the gold uh, over her shoulders and her head, but uh, the light colors. Um, the vertical is continued by the line of the architecture. And there's this sort of space that's bridged by her hand as she gestures to her two sons. These are the very famous Graeke. Uh, and they're as young, young men. And it looks like they're coming in from the outside, another room. Um, but you know, they're, they're men, so they have room, even as young men, they have room. They can move around, they can uh, go out, they can come in. Uh, and so uh, they're actually in, in movement as she points to them. Uh, the figures are idealized. I mean, the children are very cute, uh, but uh, the women particularly, and we see this with Kaufman, and we see this with other neoclassical artists, uh, the faces are these uh, absolute perfect ovals. And the friend actually has this uh, profile where uh, you don't have the indentation uh, in the profile at the eye level of the nose. Uh, it's a, a kind of classical profile you see, sometimes see on Greek vases and in classical sculpture. Uh, it's considered to be particularly ideal and, and once again, classical. So here we have some details. She also, of course, uh, painted many portraits. Um, I think for many history painters, portraits were uh, in part their bread and butter and in part uh, you know, a, a record of um, people that they knew. Um, and one of the interesting things is, of course, she has you know, commissions from aristocrats, uh, but also some very famous people uh, in history. As you see, this is a portrait of uh, Winkelmann. Uh, Winkelmann is one of the founders of art history, essentially. Uh, he was an art theorist, uh, he was a classicist, and he uh, wrote uh, art theory in the 18th century. And uh, many people see this as uh, the foundation of, uh, of, uh, of art history. Um, some people call Vasari the first art historian. Uh, Winkelmann, of course, is, is not a working artist, he's a writer. Uh, it, uh, Kaufman was then part of this intellectual circle um, in Rome. And um, I mean, that also, I think, spe speaks well of her erudition and undoubtedly social skills as well. Uh, this isn't a very good reproduction. Uh, it's much too dark. I brought it in primarily because uh, this painting is in uh, the uh, American, the National Museum of American Art, which is in Washington, D.C. 
and uh, this one and the next one I'm going to show you are both in that museum. So essentially, we own them. Uh, they're public museums. Uh, it's a portrait of John Morgan, who was a Philadelphian physician and uh, famous in, in history of, uh, of uh, medicine because he wrote a book, The Theory and Practice of Physique, a medical book. Uh, he's the founder of the Medical School of Philadelphia and was the general director of the American Revolutionary Army. Uh, this is also kind of interesting because she's combined a uh, landscape, or really, rather a seascape in a sense, uh, a bayscape, uh, with the portrait. We have uh, the, uh, the sitter sort of standing in front of the window. Uh, John Bing with a view of Naples, and there is an inscription in the book that he's looking at. It says, worth looking at with reflection. And so, you know, what's he looking at? Well, we've got this view of Naples in the background. That is obviously a beautiful view. You could look at it, you could think about it, but also the painting itself you could look at with reflection. Uh, Sometimes the paintings, and uh, this is true of Joshua Reynolds and other neoclassical artists as well, uh, sometimes the uh, portraits that she does are the portraits of someone in the guise of some classical figure. So this is a portrait of uh, Anne, the uh, Marconis of uh, Townshead, and uh, she is supposed to be Venus. Now, to us, she looks like she's you know, dressed in very uh, 18th century uh, garments, uh, big uh, 18th century hairdo, um, but this was uh, intended to represent her as the goddess of love, and then her child uh, becomes Cupid, and uh, he's holding a dove, which of course is the symbol of, uh, of Venus. So she's shown as the goddess of love with uh, her son Cupid. Uh, this one, people aren't standing in for classical deities, uh, but uh, an, an, another aristocratic portrait, uh, the Earl of Denty and his family. Uh, they're dressed very fashionably, but in a sense they're seated in a fairly informal manner. Uh, you know, it's, um, they're not, you know, it looks like they're seated there playing with their child. Uh, the actual composition, or the act, is the actual uh, child, I have to admit, looks to me like he's probably fairly idealized rather than more portrait-like. Uh, he looks like a little Renaissance Christ child, perhaps. Uh, and then we have the family dog at the bottom. Uh, could this be a symbol of, of fidelity, of uh, uh, the, the faithfulness of the family to each other, the love of the husband and wife? Uh, they just want their dog in them. You'll see lots of people like to have dogs in portraits. Um, and this particular picture I'm showing you because it is a rather large group uh, portrait. It's also in Washington, D.C. This is in the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Um, I have seen it, and it's certainly not the best Kaufman I've ever seen. I would say one of two things, either that it has been damaged because there are certain parts that uh, don't seem to be finished, or it is not finished. That's just another possibility. Um, you know the part. The composition is wonderful. It's uh, you know the 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 Renaissance and neoclassical triangular composition, and yet there's something very free about it. Uh, it's not uh, rigid, and that's one of the ways that uh, Angelica Kaufman uh, interprets neoclassicism. It's not as rigid as some of the other artists. 